So it's a story about King David this morning. And our text pick, picks up at the part of the story when David becomes king over Israel, the northern kingdom. And then David strategically takes the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, the holy city, where Jerusalem becomes the center for the ancient Jew. So this is just a very small section of the entire vast story of David. How vast, you ask, what a great question. David's story begins halfway through the book of 1 Samuel. Actually begins 1 Samuel 16 and concludes at the end of 1 Kings chapter 2. So David's story consists of 24,478 words. Now, if I read to you at the rate of, let's say, 100 words a minute, which is what I preach, it would take four hours to read the entire story of King David, get comfortable. So it's a really big story. And it's important to see how significant this story is in the life of the ancient Israel. Now, for those who are visiting I just want you to realize that we do run late sometimes at worship. But I also want you to remember that we're Presbyterians. So really late means about 15 minutes. So now instead of reading you the whole 24,478 words, I'm going to tell you the entire story of David in less than 100 words. If you don't want to listen, go ahead and count the words. If I don't tell you this story in less than 100 words, I'll buy everybody brunch. Okay, just remember, I have word count. Beginning 1 Samuel 16, here we go, start listening and or counting now. The Lord chooses David to be king. David plays the harp for King Saul. David kills Goliath. Saul becomes jealous of David. David's marriage to Michael, David's friendships with Jonathan, David meets and marries Abigail. David becomes king of Judah, the southern kingdom. David becomes king of Israel, the northern kingdom. David captures Jerusalem. David brings the Ark of Covenant to Jerusalem. David encounters Bathsheba. Solomon is born. Third son, Absalom, rebels against his father, David. Absalom dies and David mourns. David counts the people. David gives instruction to his son, Solomon, who becomes king. David dies. All in 98 words. Impressive, if I don't say so myself. But that's just to realize, for all of us to realize how big this story is. And there's, there's a lot going on. And so we're just lifting out this one little tiny part. And I really just put the summary in the bulletin for you to be able to hear that David becomes king over Israel. David brings the Ark of the Covenant with song making. Jerusalem becomes central in a place of worship. So it's really about David becoming king. And the tribes of Israel, and again, remember that's the northern kingdom, the tribes of Israel, the old gang of Saul's come to David at Hebron to persuade him to become their king, to take their throne. And they argue that he and the northern elders belong to each other in covenantal solidarity. The formula used, flesh and bone. That formula recognizes that the two parties have long stood together in strength, the bone, and in times of weakness, meaning the flesh. They belong together, and David is to be king. Second argument they present was that it was David who was destined to be king, not Saul. And we know this because in the Hebrew word, you, used in this text, is vigorously expressed. It could be translated as you. It was you. Now, for us, this would be like sending a text message or an email, all in caps. It was you, David, who is the real leader 
of the armies of Israel. Saul was merely a step. Even the Philistines knew David was Saul's most formidable, feared, and effective soldier. So based on those two factors, the covenantal solidarity and David's destiny, his, his anointment as king, Saul is dissolved, diminished. And the tribes of Israel make their case. The elders of Israel are convinced that David should use his enormous gifts of leadership and his great power to make something for the sake of the nation. They were convinced that David is to make something for them. Well, that's really where, that's really what caught my attention, this notion of to make something of, to make something for, and we're here in this story at the exact moment when the invitation is extended to, by those most deeply connected, flesh and bone, most connected to David, to make something of that ancient nation. So they agree. A covenant is made, and remember, a covenant is not about a, a contract. A contract protects two people, a covenant creates one body. So out of 12 tribes divided by two nations, a covenant creates one. So originally I thought about listing all of David's accomplishments, his making, his successes as king, because he made a lot of things happen for that, no, that nation. And we know about his role as the shepherd king uh, conventional metaphor for king indicating the responsibilities that are required of him to guard and to feed and to nurture and to protect it has been written that the primary requirement of a good shepherd is to remember that the shepherd exists for the sake of the sheep and their well-being so noticing the successes of the anointed king is important but i'm not going to do that and and the reason is that I'm not going to make that list, I'm, the list of all his accomplishments, other than it's being an interesting bit of facts and information and probably helpful at Trivia Night at Geckos. It doesn't really have much importance for our journey today. So I made this really executive, important executive decision. I decided that I would not bore you any more than usual by reciting a litany of all the things that David did, David made, did over those 40 years. So I'm not dismissive of his accomplishments, nor should we. The list matters, history matters, accomplishments matter. I would not be here without those who helped me make me. Without a strong sense of historical influences and accomplishments in my, in my life, I'm eternally grateful for all those who shepherded me along the way, made me me. But that old list, the past makings, the accomplishments, don't necessarily translate into any current relevancy. You know why? My Blackberry doesn't work anymore. And my first computer, K-Pro 2. It's beyond obsolete. We all know that things change. But theologically, we seem very slow to acknowledge that reality or to make something theologically new, spiritually alive for the community of faith we now embody. So let me pause to acknowledge it. I noticed this visibly and verbally from my time in Orlando last week. I encountered a theological awkwardness supporting the pastors who were dealing with the impacts of the shooting. They didn't seem to have any words to say. For some of those pastors who attended, it, it, was, it was very uncomfortable. Their theology and their language does not acknowledge, let alone support the LGBTQ community. In fact, some of them said they were not even able to say LBGTQ out loud or in worship. So they are truly struggling because their voice is weak and they have little to say. Their theology is really not relevant. Yeah, 
their notion of grace was evident, but grace only offered in the good old day kind of sense. The grace they extended had little relevancy for the LGBTQ community because that kind of grace had came out of an exclusiveness to our gay brothers and lesbian sisters for all those years. So there's a struggle going on. And we may be at a pivotal moment in our own story, just as David is in the, in, in the story of Israel. So here's my insight. See, I believe those, for those struggling, it originates out of a very strong sense of the old, the past. The old ways, the old words of the past. And I believe that those, are, those struggling, it centers on the fundamental experience that they have made their way. They have figured it out. They have found the answer. They have said the prayer. They are struggling to uphold a strict belief literal approach to Scripture, struggling to, to, to affirm a rigid doctrinal explanation of true faithfulness and real discipleship. They are struggling, those struggling yearn to theologically return backwards to the conventional standards which enforces their certain moral code for themselves and for everybody else. That's their struggle. The old way no longer has voice Brian McLaren wrote this book, We Make the Road by Walking, and it's a year-long uh, quest for spiritual formation, reorientation, and activism, and he shares this one simple statement, and I don't even know why it matters to me. He says, you are in the making. I am in the making. And I just think there's something beautiful to this, and let me suggest that the journey of faith is about making, making our way by the road we take. The journey of living out our faith is not a mindless march or a mechanical hike toward a predetermined destination that is defined by others or tradition or theology. We aren't in control, not really, and don't have to be by the rhythm or the reasoning of words that don't sound relevant. We make the road by walking. So if there's any truth in the statement that you are in the making, that you get to participate, that you get to engage in how you are being formed and transformed and reformed, and if McLaren's insight has any validity that we make the road by walking, Experience and relationships become key interpretive tools because each one of us has the capacity to learn, to mature, to think, and to grow as well as the choice to stagnate, regress, constrict, and lose our way. The question I pose is what are you making? What, are, what road are you taking? And if that road is filled with constant anxiety and fearful living, if you are pressured to produce more, win more, be more, if the road expects you to stay protected, maintain your assets, lure you away, or summons you toward hoarding or consuming more, I want you to hear this. Stop. Pause for just a moment and breathe. You get to make your way. You get to choose your road. And I want to invite you to make your road one that discovers new and creative ways out of old, destructive and exclusive patterns and theology. I want to invite you to make a road that will lead you to explore all the new possibilities, new ways to experience God's love, new ways to sense the presence of the Spirit. I want you to invite you to Make your way that will lead you to, un, to, to develop your unfulfilled potentials and passions. One that will lead you to discover new resources and relationships. The road you are making is filled with the Spirit informing your thoughts and your actions and your behaviors. This road, the road that you can make, the road that we can make together, can lead us to live inspired lives. And that road can make us 
and will lead us to be an inspiring presence to others in this world. The road that we make will have a whole lot of new lists of accomplishments, new successes, and that new road will lead us into ways for us to be more Christ-like. So may God continue to bless us on the road that we make. Amen.